So here's the same integral analysis we performed on the boundary layer for electroosmotic flow before. We assume that we had some wall. The key feature of this wall is that it has a potential designed to, uh, denoted as script phi non, which is different from the potential in the bulk where we're defining it to be equal to zero. We've assumed that because there's a different potential here, that's consistent with there being some electrical charge in the fluid. And so we are allowing rho sub e, this net charge density term, to be non-zero in the fluid. But we're making the assertion that this happens only in a finite distance from the wall. So somewhere I can get far enough out into the bulk where my phi is equal to zero and my rho e is equal to zero. Inside this portion of the flow, I don't really know what phi is yet, but I do know that I'm going to assume that rho sub e, the net charge density, is non-zero. <clears throat> now, I haven't specified how big, how thick this system has to be, other than to say that it's thick enough that I can get to this point that has these two different properties. So this has some length which I've left unspecified. The one thing I will say is that this statement that this control volume, or this domain of integration, that this is big enough to get to a phi of zero and a rho sub e of zero, is consistent with saying that this length has to be significantly larger than what's called the Debye length, which we'll denote as lambda sub d. And we shortly will derive exactly what this Debye length is for the system. And we'll find that it's a function of temperature and ionic concentration and things like that. This region here, we'll call an electrical double layer. <clears throat> and the idea, what we talked about last time, is that if I actuate this system, right, this is a system where some of the charge has fallen off the wall and it's floating around near the wall, and now I say, OK, well, I'm going to apply an electric field parallel to this wall. I'm denoting this as an extrinsic electric field to contrast it with the intrinsic electric field associated with this ion distribution. If I apply this extrinsic electric field, then the fluid moves. And the fact that the fluid moves is what we derived last time. <clears throat> now, I want you to th specifically think of what we've done in a little bit more detail. And I want to take a couple of the things that I just put up into the board and I maybe didn't uh, substantiate quite that thoroughly. I want to go back and re-examine a couple of those things. In particular, you'll recall that I separated out this extrinsic electric field. And also, when I did the integrations, I assumed that it was uniform. Right? So I did integrations with respect to y. I never specifically said that the extrinsic electric field was, was uniform, but I treated it as a, con a constant when I did the integration. And so inside the electrical double layer, which I'll routinely abbreviate as EDL, I assumed the, that the extrinsic field was uniform. Now, macroscopically, if I look at a system, anytime I have some geometric complexity, if I have a tube that goes from small to wide, from narrow to wide, or if there's a turn, the extrinsic electric field in that system will always be non-uniform. But for the purposes of my integration, I assume that it was uniform enough that it could be treated as a constant for that integration. <clears throat> Outside the electrical double layer, I've made this simplifying assumption that rho sub b is equal to 0, and this basically allows me to ignore the electrokinetics outside the electrical double layer. I'm basically turning the electrical double layer into a boundary condition. And the complements of both of these things are that outside the electrical double layer, my extrinsic electric field can be non-uniform. And similarly, inside this electrical double layer, I've assumed that the charge density is not equal to 0. And in fact, the analysis that we've performed and the way we've implemented things so far is essentially a matched asymptotic analysis. What I mean by that is I could solve this whole system assuming everywhere that rho sub e is not equal to 0 and assuming everywhere that the electric field is non-uniform, but that analysis is inherently more complicated and usually requires that I do it numerically. 
However, as long as this layer is reasonably thin, and because having this layer be thin is in fact routine, right? I mean, it's only nanometers thick. I don't have that many microfluidic devices where a nanometer thick region fills up a large part of the, of the area of the system. So because it's pretty safe for me to assume that this electrical double layer is often thin, it allows me to approach the electroosmotic problem using a matched asymptotic analysis. And in fact, that's basically what I did last time. What I did is I said, I'm going to break this up into two problems. Inside the electrical double layer, I'm going to make a key assumption, which is that this extrinsic electric field is uniform on the length scales of this domain. That allowed me to do all the analysis I did last time, assuming that this was a constant. When I integrated respect with respect to y, I assumed that the potential was changing and that the velocity was changing, but I assumed that the viscosity, for example, was uniform. I assumed the electrical permittivity was uniform, and I assumed that the extrinsically applied electric field was uniform. This is what made that integral super easy. If this was unknown, I never could have done that. I mean, I could have done that integral, but I would have had to leave it in a formal integral form. I wouldn't have gotten a nice algebraic answer. Outside this electrical double layer, <coughs> I get to the point where rho sub e is equal to 0, and so this means I can just solve this with the Navier-Stokes equations with no forcing. And now I can allow this extrinsic electric field to be non-uniform. So what this means <coughs> is that my analysis of this electrical double layer had a specific restriction here that my extrinsic field had to be uniform. But it doesn't preclude, me preclude my using the electroosmotic result, which is that u is equal to minus epsilon times the wall potential over eta times this extrinsically applied field. And in fact, if I have no pressure gradient in the system, and if phi sub naught is uniform, I can actually say that everywhere in my system, the velocity vector u is proportional to this extrinsically applied electric field. And when we make this assumption, this is consistent with our flow being potential. There's no divergence in the bulk. There's no divergence of the electric field, because Gauss's law says that del dot d is equal to rho e. But if rho e is equal to 0, that means that del dot d is 0, which means that del dot e is equal to 0. So the divergence of this is 0 in the bulk when I'm outside the electrical double layer. <coughs> That's consistent with this being um, being incompressible. And because I've introduced no vorticity into the system, I can now def describe that velocity as being the proportional to the gradient of a scalar potential. And that's the definition of my potential flow. OK. So this is all the, basically the same as last time. The only thing we've done is we've gone back and we've clarified a little bit that really what we've done is we've stitched together two different solutions. A solution outside that has this as a simplifying case, but this as a complexity. And a situation on the inside that has this as a simplification and this as a complexity. The key result we got from this analysis was that just outside this electrical double layer, I get this expression that locally the velocity parallel to the wall is given by epsilon phi naught over eta times this extrinsically applied electric field, which near the wall we can consider as a scalar. <coughs> and that is this expression. <coughs> 